Hello, everybody. My name is Rebecca Parsons. I'm one of the co-hosts for the ThoughtWorks Technology Podcast, and I'm joined by my colleague, Prem. Hello, everyone. I'm very glad to be here. Looking forward to a great conversation today. And we are joined by two guests. Uh, first, I have one of uh, my other colleagues at ThoughtWorks. Uh, Justin, would you please introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Justin, and I've been, I work with E4R, uh, and I work as a lead developer in E4R. And joining us uh, from the project itself, uh, Niraj, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Uh, hi, everyone. I am Nidish Gupta. I am an astronomer, and I work at uh, the Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics. It's a research institute based in India. So let's start with introducing the, the, the problem. Uh, what, what is it that we're trying to solve, and, and how have you approached this? And let's start with... What, what's the science problem that, that we're trying to solve? Because the principle of E4R really is uh, to remind people that we are trying to bring, we as ThoughtWorks are trying to bring our software development capabilities and our technology capabilities to assist scientists like Niraj in solving science problems. So Niraj, can you tell us a little bit about what the problem is we're trying to solve? Yeah, sure. Uh so the central problem that we are trying to address is to understand how galaxies form and evolve. Now, what are galaxies? When we think about them, galaxies are an ensemble of stars, but they also contain a lot of gas. And these stars form from uh, this gas. So one thing when we want to uh, do is to, uh, when we try to understand galaxies, is to understand how galaxies can acquire this gas from outside and can then convert it into stars. But this is not so simple because uh, at the center of these galaxies, there is also usually a massive black hole sitting. And this black hole at times can emit huge amounts of energy. And this energy can be so large, so huge, that it can actually outshine all the stars that are put, put together in the galaxy. And it can also emit a lot of uh, material into the galaxy. And all this uh, feedback that is coming from black hole can actually uh, disrupt the process through which galaxies can actually convert this gas that they have acquired painstakingly into stars. So understanding galaxy evolution, that is their formation and how they would evolve uh, over a period of time is essentially uh, to understand this interplay between gas, stars, and the feedback that is coming from the central black hole. And now this is a very complex problem as you can imagine. And there are several long-standing uh, questions related to this. So what we are doing now is to use uh, the most sensitive radio telescope uh, in South Africa called the Mirka telescope. And we are uh, obtaining a lot of data of uh, millions of galaxies uh, in the sky. Uh, essentially, we are taking observations of 1,600 hours. This will lead to 1.6 petabytes of data. And all this is being gathered over a period of about three years. And that's something which we have to process and uh, and try to sort of uh, understand uh, that how these galaxies form and evolve. Excellent. Justin, can you talk us through the problem from the technology perspective? What what have we been doing to try to support um, support this work? Okay, uh, so from a technology perspective, uh, the problem is twofold. One is the data, the amount of data that we would be looking at. Now, as Neeraj had uh, mentioned earlier, uh, so Meerkat is state-of-the-art telescope and it is going to generate a lot of data. And we, at the point when uh, the collaboration started, we had no uh, benchmark to kind of understand uh, how to process this data. This would be a large volume of data. So from a data perspective, this was a very big problem, uh, problem statement to handle. And that was the first unknown. So what happens when you get a large volume of data on the scale of petabyte? How do you process it? The second one uh, was mostly from the domain aspect itself. So how do you build a robust pipeline to support uh, a science uh, which from a technology standpoint, from, uh, I mean, if I talk uh, from my perspective as a technologist, astrophysics is a, a domain which I'm not uh, so uh, comfortable with. So how do we design a software where we understand the domain while also keeping in mind the unknowns which are brought in uh, via both the data and the domain itself, the volume of the data and the domain. So that was a challenge from the technology perspective. 
mostly delivering a robust system which will enable the science to uh, kind of progress further given the unknown that we are kind of handling such a scenario for the first time and how did we get involved how 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 did this this collaboration start what was what was the the impetus for for this collaboration so i can tell my perspective on this and then justin can add uh, to it uh, so when we started thinking about executing this project uh, in 2015 and 16, that's uh, quite a while ago, just from the simple back of the envelope calculations, it was clear to us that if we want to process this 1.6 petabytes of data using traditional methods uh, of those times, which is like an astronomer will take data from telescope, load it onto their uh, high-end workstation and then sort of look at it and in their own time and process it, it would take close to 20 to 30 years of time. That's so, so it was obviously clear that we cannot use just those uh, traditional methods which have all the worked for decades uh, to, uh, uh, to work on a project of uh, this scale. So it was obvious to us that we need to bring in uh, best software engineering practices on board to uh, solve this problem. And then second aspect was uh, also clear to us that, uh, uh, and, and that's coming from the complexity of the data itself, that we cannot use uh, off the shelf uh, tools, even, even in the software domain. So we need to work with uh, like uh, best in the field in every domain. And that's where uh, we started discussing with ThoughtWorks and, and, and we uh, sort of agreed upon that, okay, like sort of we will, we will start working on this. So, so can you can you uh, elaborate a little bit on what kind of system we built? Uh, so the uh, the entire phase of the project, I mean, the entire uh, collaboration was uh, done in phase wise manner. So the first was uh, practically prototyping it, uh, coming up and understanding can this even be done. Uh, so prototype it, proof of concept, get a proof of concept out, and that then becomes your base benchmark to start with. That was uh, the initial phase, and with that prototype being a success. Uh, knowing that yes uh, something like this can be built uh, the unknown just being the data volume how the data volume is going to affect but but just from a science perspective the proof of concept is done that then we entered into the phase two uh, where we actually dwelled into uh, building the system proper uh, concrete system which would which would help us uh, uh, kind of progress through this journey where the data where we can start with identifying what to observe when to observe and what to do once the data comes in uh, while keeping in uh, areas checkpoints that you know if something fails how do we fall back uh, what are the checkpoints uh, to make sure that the processing goes in smoothly uh, that was the second phase and then uh, then came the third phase where now we have the data we have processed we have some sort of images generated out of it how do we make it publicly accessible move ahead with uh, you know the science the science is done uh, to be consumed by people at the end. So how do we make it available to uh, people at large? So overall journey, overall picture of how the overall, uh, what is this collaboration is kind of structured. Yeah, so can, can you tell us a little bit about what the flow of information is and, and a, a bit more specifically, I mean, so far we know there's lots of data and you know that that's a very general problem but can can you tell us a little bit more okay we we we've got the observations what kinds of things are you looking for in the data um and what are the properties that you're trying to maintain when we're processing the the the, the data um other than the fact that yes there's a lot of it and we need to make sure we process it efficiently so to understand this, uh, we need to uh, take a step back and just look at what is the complexity of the data. So we have, as I said, we have got this lot of data, 1.6 petabytes of data. And what we are trying to do is to look at the sky. And, and it's a radio telescope that we are using, which means that we want to look at the sky at radio wavelengths, right? And uh, so the act of seeing, which we are so used to uh, with our eyes when we look up and try to look at the stars or moon, uh, it, it all happens through this lens, which is sitting in our eye, right? And, and we take it for granted. Mathematically, if we look at it, it's actually doing a process which we call as Fourier transform, right? So it's, a, it's actually a Fourier transformer, which is sitting in our eye. But this lens, uh, which is so readily available at optical wavelengths to us uh, in, through nature, 
is not really, uh, does not function the same way uh, at radio wavelengths. So what we do actually at radio wavelengths is to build a telescope, which actually consists of large number of dishes or uh, like antennas. So in case of Meerkat, it is 64 antennas, which has, which are spread over an area of eight kilometers. And what we do is that we, we take voltages from each of these uh, antennas and combine them in pair. For example, if there are three antennas, like we will combine signal from one and two, two and three and three and one, like this we would do for 64. And then a data stream is flowing to us. Uh, that is like every few seconds. And then it is coming as uh, a function of uh, frequency that is like 32 sampled uh, frequencies uh, coming to us. And then, uh, so, so that's the complex data uh, that we have. And what we do with this data is that we take it and do a Fourier transform of it, which is equivalent to the process of actually making a lens at the radio wavelengths, right? Once we make this lens in, in to our computer uh, and electronic data processing, then it actually is equivalent to producing an image uh, very similar to what we would see. Now, uh, at the processing level, the complexity comes from uh, at two levels. One is that the large volume of this itself, which needs to pass through uh, our systems to be able to process reliably and efficiently. Uh, the data is organized in these three dimensions, which are frequency, time, and antenna separations, such that the different frequencies, uh, the different data processing steps actually cannot be partitioned in the same way. So we cannot actually say that, okay, I'm going to take this data partitioning strategy, and this is what I can apply to all these different steps of data processing, and then this can actually lead to the, uh, give me the image out of it. So, so we need a system which can actually work through these different stages with different uh, uh, partitioning or uh, solving strategy. That is one level of complexity that, uh, that comes in that this pipeline has to uh, tackle. And, and second, uh, is related to the nature of the pro project. And that is uh, that building this pipeline is going to take time because it's it's complex, right? And the requirements of this uh, pipeline should come from the telescope performance because it's supposed to process the data from this telescope. But the telescope is not yet built and we cannot wait till the telescope is built and we know its properties completely, right? So we have to quickly start building this system well before the telescope has uh, come into place and we understand it completely. So as Justin was talking uh, about that, uh, we do, uh, uh, we spend a lot of time in prototyping. So, so, so we build a system which can actually cater to a, a, a large number of uh, data processing or uh, solving scenarios. And then we test it against a variety of telescopes that were available at that time. And, and we left those options open so that like when, as soon as the telescope comes online, we process the real data through it, we can quickly make those choices, optimize our pipeline and start processing its data so that we are ready for it when it comes. Because uh, we, we have to remember that this 1.6 petabytes of data is actually coming over a period of three years. And uh, our system has to be efficient that we process actually 1.6 petabytes in about three to four years of time. We cannot take five years or 10 years uh, for that. So, so, so to be able to meet that the system has to be prototyped and ready well before uh, we actually start even our processing. So, so um, uh, again, trying to understand here. So you're, uh, even before the telescopes actually started transmitting real data, the prototype actually created some sort of synthetic data to simulate what the actual telescopes will send you and then and then now you you saw the results of that so that when the telescopes did become ready you're uh, you're you're you know ready to go as far as being able to process it correctly is that a fair representation of how we solve the problem so we use uh, simulated data that's uh, correct but we also used real data from the best telescopes of that time because we also wanted to uh, actually ensure that our pipeline is actually uh, is, is responsive to the real world scenario because in with simulations there can be limitation that you can actually get a result that you have put in the simulation right you you can not be hundred percent sure that you actually are testing against a real scenario and I I understand that even uh, with this uh, initial prototype 
uh, we actually made a real scientific di di discovery. So can you briefly tell us that discovery? And then Justin, I'll, I'll ask you a little bit about how that came about. Yeah, so as uh, we were describing uh, the, the prototyping stage, and uh, uh, I mentioned that we also tested against uh, real data from the best telescopes of that time. And uh, so we were looking at these uh, galaxies, uh, which are fairly distant from us. And we ended up detecting uh, the traces of hydroxyl molecules in the galaxy. And when I was describing this uh, central problem, which is to understand how galaxies uh, form and evolve, uh, in that problem space, uh, the, 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 the cold phase of gas, actually, cold atomic and molecular phase of gas, it is as cold as like 10 or 20 Kelvin, actually acquires a very special uh, Place. It's, it's central to understanding how gas can be converted into stars. And this hydroxyl uh, ion is actually a very nice a tracer of it. And very, of, very few of these have been detected uh, in past. So uh, through this prototyping phase itself, we were able to detect one such case, which was uh, very exciting. We got it published uh, in a very prestigious journal. That's one aspect of it. But at the same time, it also gave us a confidence that when we are going to do this large scale survey, we are going, we, we, we will surely be able to detect many more of these in the sky. So Justin, that must have been pr pretty exciting to, to have, have the work that, that, that you did re result in the scientific di discovery. How did you approach this from the perspective of the technologist in terms of, um, setting up this pipeline in, in, in a way to assist Niraj in his research. So there's a funny story behind that discovery itself. So the team uh, back then, while they were working on this pipeline, they were like, yes, let's test it out. It's a queuing phase of the pipeline. Let's do it. And we have the data. And uh, while testing, they're like, uh, we have this uh, plot generated from the pipeline and it might seem like an anomaly. It might be because the pipeline is not configured properly. And uh, I think uh, that is a point when they got in touch with Niraj and said, uh, maybe you can just validate if the pipeline is running properly. And, uh, and voila, we have a discovery during the QA phase of the pipeline itself. So that is uh, one uh, I mean, incident, how uh, the discovery came into being. And uh, I, I remember a comment back then. I mean, uh, this is the phase when I was uh, really joining into the project at the, back then. So uh, the developer back then told me that uh, uh, the statement was, if it were done via script back then, a basic script, this might have been skipped uh, because the script would not have been robust enough to kind of capture it the way the pipeline, the way the pipeline was designed and the pipeline was able to capture it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, so uh, from a uh, from a point of uh, what you say, confidence, it, it kind of... Uh, told us that, yes, we can, uh, I mean, even though the pipeline is still in a phase where uh, we exactly do not know uh, that it might work properly or not, we are at a state where we can confidently say that, yes, uh, we can proceed. Uh, there is, uh, we have the confidence that it, it will perform properly. Uh, that was in the prototyping, uh, the output of the prototype. Now, uh, Taking inspiration or taking keeping that as the baseline of development, uh, I, I think we uh, developed a kind of four uh, parallel pipelines. Uh, taking that as the uh, what do you say the baseline, and building on top of that. So we have the base systems as the same, and we change uh, the subsystem so that they do different operations in between. So in in total, we built four uh, data processing pipelines. One uh, for the different stages in the data preparation itself. And uh, it was all, uh, and what uh, the researcher at the end, uh, what uh, Dr. Neeraj could do was uh, chain these pipelines together to achieve uh, or do the science which he intended to do with it. So, yeah, that uh, that was the way in which the overall, uh, uh, what do you say, the development was uh, followed through. Yeah, very exciting. Very, uh, it makes me curious. What kind of technologies does uh, did you use to uh, to build this kind of a system? So to understand that, so we need to understand what the underlying uh, astronomical tool which we were using. So the underlying uh, tool which was used uh, was CASA, and the APIs provided by CASA was in Python. So uh, what we used is uh, we used Python to write modules which would then chain together the individual aspects of the data processing into a pipeline form. And uh, 
the overall design was configurable in a way that you could switch off uh, certain aspects of the pipeline if you did not want to run it. Uh, so the entire system was robust enough uh, in such a way that I, I can choose which phase of the data processing I would want to run and which one, uh, I mean, knowing, say, for example, I'm rerunning a certain data cleaning activity. I know certain cleaning activities have been done before. I would not want to rerun it. So my configuration would allow me to choose very specific parts of that process in itself. And this was uh, one pipeline. And similarly, we uh, we had similar Python uh, applications. I would call it applications itself. And so, Niraj, would, would you say these these modules and this this configuration is something that made sense to you uh, from the perspective of of uh, the analysis that's familiar to you as as a scientist? Oh, yes, because uh, we worked very closely and collaboratively over all these years. So all the configurations that uh, go into fine tuning of this and uh, all the outputs that come out of it, we uh, designed test and tested them together. That's one uh, crucial aspect of uh, our, uh, our project. And then uh, in addition to this, uh, what Justin has described, we also uh, had a few additional requirements, one being that uh, it has, because we are dealing with just these large volumes of data that one data set, that one hour of data that we get from the telescope for to make certain type of images can actually take uh, a week of processing on our cluster. So the pipeline has to couple uh, very nicely with uh, the, these set of processes that will run on our uh, high performance computing system that we set up at Ayuka. And then our uh, research team is actually geographically distributed. So, so we also uh, needed a system uh, which our uh, team can actually access seamlessly uh, without uh, any uh, hindrance of like where they are actually uh, physically located. So that was another uh, major requirement. And then uh, since the data volume is so large at all stages actually, when the data comes uh, from South Africa to India at our institute, we load it using tapes to uh, the uh, our uh, the, the the storage associated with our cluster. Uh, from that stage, then we have to process it, and then we have to archive it. And then also, when we get these different data products, which are images of galaxies or their spectra, which is their brightness as a function of frequency, uh, all these. Uh, so we are talking about millions of objects and millions of spectra that we have to. Uh, uh, may uh, process and make it available to uh, our team. So this means, uh, so since everything is so complex and uh, large volume, large numbers, that we have to have a system which can deal with all the stages uh, seamlessly. It's, it's not that just process the data and stop it and someone else will take care of the products, right? We have to have a system which can actually the moment data is there, it can understand that, okay, that this is the data that I need to process. And then it sort of processes through it. It should be able to tell us that, okay, whether it processed successfully or not. Uh, if, if not, then at what stages it may have failed so that someone can actually address the issue, looking at various diagnostics that have been produced by the pipeline. Because it has to be very efficient. Uh, uh, otherwise, like, uh, if, if, if a scientist has to look at the data uh, while they are processing, and the total processing time for this data is three years while we are observing, this means that, during those three years, we can actually either process the data or do the science, right? So we have to have a system where like scientists engages with the processing, they prototype it, they configure it, the pipeline, and when they uh, fire the process after that, they can actually think about their science, right? So I think this is what we uh, achieved through the, uh, the design that uh, Justin described, that uh, a scientist has come in, spend time in configuring it, but once they have done it, they can actually process, trigger the processing and forget and start thinking about uh, their science. And that's why we have all been able to make these discoveries while the data is still coming. And I, I understand that in addition to the d discovery from the prototype stage, that there, there have been a, a additional d discoveries of, as you've been processing the data. So can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so this actually, again, uh, uh, highlights the point that whenever we look at the sky with a new telescope, which has capabilities which did not exist before, then uh, every time we point it in the sky, we are going to, can, can be surprised, right? Provided the data has been processed properly. So we, uh, through Meerkat, we are getting data, which is uh, 
covering such a large range in frequency that when we were observing this uh, particular galaxy in the sky, in, in, in this particular situation, uh, what happens that this galaxy actually contains a lot of cold atomic and molecular gas, which I was talking about. So naturally, it actually has a lot of stars in it as well. But what happen, uh, What happens when stars form, they also emit a lot of radiation. And this radiation can then ionize the gas or the, destroy the cold gas from which they actually formed, right? It, it looks counterintuitive, but this is what happens in nature. And when this gas gets ionized, it actually emits a different kind of a radiation, which we call as a recombination lines, because we call it recombination lines, because electrons which have been sort of uh, ejected from the atoms or molecules, they are combining back. So that's why it is called recombining. And from physics, we expect that it should produce certain signatures at radio wavelengths, but these signatures are so weak that they have not uh, been really uh, detected uh, reliably in past. So in but in this particular case, what happened that uh, we, we, we got this, this nice, beautiful spectra of this object. We knew that it should contain the signature of this because that's what we expect from our understanding of basic physics, and that can never be wrong because physics is robust. And uh, But those signatures are actually not happening at, a, at one frequency. In this spectra, which has like more than 64,000 pixels, they are happening at maybe th at 30 to dif 50 different locations. So what we did was that we, we identified those locations based on our expectation from basic physics, and then we average and combine them uh, in, in, in frequency space. And, and we did, when we did this, the signal actually really came out uh, very significantly. And this discovery was uh, is very important uh, from two aspects. One is that it validates the basic physics that we uh, understand and we expect it to work even in these uh, distant galaxies. And also uh, this detection implies that we should be able to detect many more of such systems with Meerkat, our survey, and also with the future telescopes such as Kerkilometer Array, which may be uh, even more sensitive. So this has actually, uh, uh, kind of opened up a new field, which we know should exist, but it was not really becoming accessible. So it has, it, it has, it, it's one uh, significant step in making this uh, field accessible and open to community. This is really, really exciting, uh, this discovery, right? Uh, can you tell us about the Meerkat Absorption Line Survey, please? So Meerkat Absorption Line Survey is the name of uh, this large survey project that we are carrying out with uh, Meerkat Telescope that I mentioned uh, in the beginning, uh, we are observing uh, for 1600 hours approximately these uh, tons of galaxies in the sky and understand how galaxies in general uh, form and evolve. And uh, so our idea is that uh, we, we are observing approximately 400 patches, different patches in the sky that have been uh, selected with a certain emphasis that these are the best locations to understand the formation of galaxies and detect especially the cold atomic and molecular gas phases because that's what we are actually uh, trying to look for in these uh, galaxies. And up to this point, we have uh, acquired close to one petabyte of data and we have through the pipeline processed more than 700 terabytes of data. And uh, from this first uh, batch of data processing, we have now identified half a million uh, uh, objects in the sky. And most of these are actually supermassive black holes. And many of them have been detected for the first time. And that essentially forms the first data release uh, of our project. By data release, we mean that we have actually organized this data in a form that not only our team can use this for various science objectives, but also the astronomy community at large can use this uh, in a very efficient manner. And this is a very significant milestone for, uh, for several reasons. Uh, the foremost, uh, which is relevant for our project, MALS, is, is, is that uh, uh, with this release, we have actually ticked all the boxes, uh, like uh, all the things that our project should do, starting from uh, uh, carrying out observations till actually the end of like getting these images uh, of the sky from which science can be done, right? And and it includes processing archive and everything, all the stages of pipeline that uh, Justin uh, described. 
So, so that's one very important aspect. So this gives us a lot of confidence now that like uh, we, 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 we can process the rest of the data. It's just a matter of time. And then on the basis of it, we will be able to tell whatever that is there in the sky, right? Because now we know that we can do it and we can do it properly. So that's uh, one very important aspect. And second uh, Im Im important aspect is that we have also been able to make this uh, publicly available to the uh, astronomy community at large. And that's important because this data is very rich and very complex, and it contains a lot of information. Our survey team has got certain objectives. We will uh, uh, do science based on those objectives, and uh, we will put this out also in public domain. But then there's a lot of other science that can be done with this data, which we cannot do. We cannot do for various reasons. One being that we know that this can be done, this must be done, but it's just too much. We, we are a small team. We have finite resources, so we cannot do everything. So the community should will do it. And the second thing is that there, there are types of uh, things that can be done with this data, which we which our team cannot do. We don't have expertise. So putting this out in public domain enables all those uh, possibilities. And of course, the third one being that like none of us know at this point that what this data can can do actually after two years or three years, maybe someone else with a new perspective or better abilities will come along and look at this data and do those new things. So, so, so this is how uh, the projects of this scale needs to be executed that we, we not only enable what we want to do, but we also share everything that has been done uh, publicly so that it can actually be improved upon and much more can be done with that. So that tells a little, tells us a little bit about where this is going from the science perspective. Uh, Justin, where else can this uh, can this pipeline go from a from a technology perspective? are are there are there things that 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 you're looking to do? Are there different applications that you might want to take into account? Wait, wait what's the future for the tech? we 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 know the the future for this the science, which is already very exciting. but what's the future for the tech? So to answer that, I'll slightly sidestep into a, a bit uh, on the lines of cognitive burden. Okay, uh, so a researcher, uh, for a researcher, the primary goal is the science. Data processing is a process through which they kind of reach to the science. Now, if a researcher requires multiple tools, uh, switching between these tools kind of uh, causes a cognitive overload for them. Uh, it's it's a very easy trap to get into uh, to lose context of where they were or lose uh, track of what they were thinking. I mean, a very simple case would be, uh, I would be starting with a tool thinking about something and by the time I'm done, what do you say, configuring the tool, uh, the thought chain in itself is broken. So that cognitive burden uh, is something uh, which we can reduce by following an idea or approach which we have done uh, for the entire MALS uh, survey or the RTIP, which includes the RTIP pipeline, uh, along with the you know the environment which we provide along with it. So it's it's the idea is very uh, akin to a science platform itself. So we take that learnings from RTIP. Uh, so we know how powerful uh, the idea in itself is having a unified platform where all the tools which are required by the researcher is available, the data flow is transparent to them. So in the case of RTIP, uh, uh, the researcher did not have to worry about what happens after one phase of data processing, where does the data go from there? What, uh, what does the second phase do with it? They just had to prepare a config. Yes, I mean, they had to put uh, thought into how the config would look like, but once the config was done, uh, they did not have to worry about uh, the management of data in uh, like uh, in depth they knew the uh, the next coming pipeline will take care of it or the next coming tool chain will take care of that data it knows where the data resides and where it needs to go so taking that idea one step further uh, can a science uh, can we take inspiration from this to build science platforms uh, at large scales uh, very much on uh, the emphasis being the large scale where uh, the volume data volume is large and the processing timelines in itself uh, are uh, kind of, let's say, weeks or months. I mean, uh, such a system would uh, enable the scientist or the researcher to very specifically focus on the outcomes of the research rather than getting, uh, you know, get into the nitty gritty of how individual systems would interact, uh, how what happens if, let's say, API call fails, just as an example. I mean, uh, the system is built in such a way that it knows what to do or uh, how to manage such a failure. 
what happens if a uh, processing fails uh, what kind of message should a researcher get is the researcher getting too much verbose uh, errors i mean or are they just getting what they need to know so building such massive science platforms is one uh, what you say major learning which we take from this and uh, i think that idea uh, we i mean there are other domains so say for example uh, the pharma uh, domain is one where such uh, such pipelines can now help so we start with uh, a hypothesis uh, put that hypothesis to test in a, a robust pipeline which uh, takes in data produces goes through multiple processes produces an output and the researcher is just uh, involved in the initial phase of uh, kind of designing how the pipeline looks like and then that it is repeatable secondly such a science platform allows you for reproducibility of results so uh, once uh, uh, let's say i mean let's just take the first example of the initial discovery uh, we thought it was an anomaly but because we could rerun it on the pipeline more efficiently within a limited uh, span of time we could reproduce that results over and over again and we knew that it is not an anomaly it is a concrete result which can be used so reproducibility also comes along and also it uh, kind of uh, generalizes or you know in in, in science basically uh, reproducibility along with how to reproduce it so if i have a well established system like a science platform which says these are the tool set tool chains which were chained together with these configurations and if you run it as it is you get the result uh, so that kind of emphasizes on uh, reproducibility of the result how uh, i mean if someone is starting from uh, taking this as a base point baseline they can reach that baseline pretty easily because they have uh, everything that is required to reach there on the first place and from there they can uh, develop further uh, both on science and the tech aspect itself so if uh, there are other tools which can be interlinked into this science platform idea they can interlink it because the base system is already available so th that is where this idea can grow from uh, this point uh, and and artip has been a great inspiration uh, in kind of thinking in that direction it it kind of allows you to uh, think about what happens if uh, uh, what happens when you get a large volume of data as an example what happens if the domain is unknown how do you kind of interact with the researcher to understand uh, or incorporate the uh, domain into the technology how what how do you integrate a tool and it also opens up an arena where uh, you know the idea of collaboration between a researcher and a technologist kind of uh, goes in a symbiotic fashion so we understand uh, so we make progress in the technology perspective where uh, let's say i mean if in other projects in ifora uh, we are developing hardware which kind of uh, can process large volume of data so we can now take inspiration uh, so we can uh, grow in that technology aspect while the researcher along with us uh, grows in the science aspect so it's a symbiotic relationship from this point on excellent well i'd like to thank you all once again another fascinating uh, set of discoveries coming out of our engineering for re research group e4r so i would like to thank you justin and thank you niraj for joining us and and explaining to us uh, the joys of star creation and gold gases and how you're making all of this information available so other scientists can uh, build on, on the, on the data, data set we've, we've made available to them. So thank you very much. Pleasure. Yeah. Hey folks.